Let's run to the word um, this morning, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 11, verses 1 through 12. I promise I will be brief this morning. I will say in advance, excuse me, this was probably more for me. Um, of course, God preached to me first, and I had to hear it again, so I'm preaching it to myself again. And I'll just let you listen in on as he preaches, encourages me. Amen. Is that all right? Matthew 11, 1 through 12. Matthew 11, 1 through 12. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. All right. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go about into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. <laughs> then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he is least in the kingdom of heaven. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here's our focal text. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. If I could, I want to tag this text anxiety or advancement. Anxiety or advancement. And so for the past um, several weeks, um, we've been dealing with, I believe, um, a lot of our theme for the year, the concept and reality of God's kingdom. And so last week we talked about contrast in the kingdom. And so if I could continue um, instruction and pedagogy in light of our theme, um, if I could prophetically um, just tell you what I sense in the body of Christ. Right. And so again, as I talk to um, pastors as part of um, the director of pastors and full gospel over three over a region, this, um, our state and our region, and talk to different pastors and um, again in different places, but also here locally in our city. But also as I experience um, pastoring this local assembly, um, just want to um, present again what I see prophetically and where we are. On uh, one, I believe whether you would really admit it or not. In the body of Christ, there is a lack of spiritual fervor and feeling. I'll say it again. In the body of Christ, and again, one of the metaphors for the church is um, the church is a body, as well as a building and a bride. But as a body, I want you to look through that lens um, for the next several moments. There is a lack of spiritual fervor and feeling. In other words, bodies are not filled with the spirit. There's Christians who are not filled, and there are Christians who lack spiritual fervor. I would suggest the bite of Christ is in a spiritual state of malnutrition. The body of Christ does eat. However, its diet over the last several decades, this hasn't happened overnight, it's happened over decades. Um, the diet over the last decades has been inappropriate for maximum modus. In other words, like I understand now, I've come to understand, um, athletes eat to perform. In other words, they don't eat just to eat. They eat so they can get the maximum use and benefit from their bodies. The body of Christ must eat well in order to minister and serve well. 
I suggest then the state of the body of Christ, again, is malnutrition based on not just church attendance. That is a, an indicator. But I would suggest it's based on how we minister, All right. how we serve. One of the things that turns me off is poor service in a restaurant. One way to turn me off from ever attending your restaurant again is if I go to your restaurant and your server acts like they do not want to serve well. You all are quiet. To me, poor service does not just speak of the person serving, but it speaks of the establishment. Because if the establishment would allow poor service, that means the owners and the managers, something is within them to walk around and to observe and to allow poor service to exist in their establishment. I say the same thing in the church. Sometimes I look around and I see poor service. And poor service is a result of malnutrition. It's what and how we have been eating. Well, why do you say that? Because research has shown there exists a link between the food we eat and our emotional and physical well-being and disease. All right. In other words, what you eat impacts your physical man and your emotional man. Right. I suggest the spiritual and physical condition of the body of Christ is lethargy and fatigue and anxiety disorder. In other words, because we have not eaten well, we are now lethargic and fatigued. Right. And the church is plagued with anxiety disorder. You all are quiet, um, but what you all don't realize, I believe, because of uh, my position and function in the body of Christ, is that God allows me to see beyond your physical demeanor, and I see spiritual demeanors. And I can just, if I could just be honest, um, folk come into church tired. Come on. Folk come into church already worn out on their face. Right. Folk come into church with weariness on their face. Folk come into church um, despondent and despondency on their face. Folk come to church uh, not, I, I thought it was tardy and I thought it was late, but they don't come late, they come lethargic. The clock is just an indicator of lethargy, not tardiness. The clock is an indicator of your inner resolve of where you are with God and what's going on with you. Some folk cannot help but to get here tardy or late because of the lethargy that's in them. In other words, you don't intentionally come late. You just can't get moved to be on time. And you can't get moved to be on time because there's nothing that has sparked your fervor and your passion to get to see what God has for you. Y'all are quiet, but I'm going to talk real today. If you are consistently taught it to work, your evaluation suggests that there's a lack of professionalism. There's a lack of preparation. And your, your capacity for leadership is questionable. Why is there a difference in the body of Christ? Why is there a different conclusion that when I have low expectation of what God has for me, that it speaks of my capacity for more? Anxiety disorder is the second deep-rooted disease in the body of Christ. Wow. I don't really like Google, but I'm going to use Google for this definition. Google suggests that anxiety is intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. Yeah. Not crisis. Yeah. Let me read it again. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the time to wake up. Anxiety disorder, according to Google, and, and the only reason I used it because these words just rang salient to me. Intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. In other words, the normal occurrences of life cause intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear. 
We are anxious about everyday life because we are too tired to physically exercise because we have so many competing priorities that we don't have time to cook healthy work, healthy food, work two jobs, run the ball games during the week, help with homework, make good love to my spouse, clean the house. (laughs) Y'all quiet up in here. Y'all real quiet up in here. Ergo, the body of Christ is so out of balance and anxious with the everyday, the spiritual man gets neglected with fast food prayer lives, with quickie devotionals, with straightening up versus cleaning up personal devotion, and the consequences that anemic body half filling spiritually low church buildings. All right. <laughs> so the church acquiesces to carnality. So what is carnality? Number one, it is shallow success. So the church now, we, we want shallow success where we mimic the cosmos rather than model for the cosmos. In other words, we, we begin to duplicate what the world says is success instead of model to the world what success is. Why? Because it's easy to copy something than create something. Not only do we have shallow success, we have entertainment ears. We now live in a day where we would rather listen to your Facebook post than speak for ourselves. So instead of me speaking, I'll just like what you say. Not only do we have shallow success, do we have entertainment ears, but we have prodigious pride. Where we have self-promotion versus love of the neighbor. We have lascivious living. Compromised living rather than covenant accountability. Right. Yeah, you'd rather, we'd rather live compromised than with covenant accountability. And we have emotional immaturity. Where we have sleeping ver- sweeping versus cleaning. Y'all are quiet now. So we have, as the prophet um, Elijah, um, after he is confronted with Jezebel, or before he's confronted with Jezebel, he runs to what's called the juniper tree, and he has a bout of depression. And what we don't know really was hidden in the text about that text is, is that juniper actually is translated to broom. So now we have what we call, and what we do in the church, we sweep things away instead of clean. Y'all are quiet. And then we have the confusion of mercy and grace. The confusion of mercy and grace. The confusion of mercy and grace. Most, most saints in the New Testament church suggest that they are living in grace. However, they're really living in mercy. Well. Because mercy is the realization and the expression of that which you don't deserve. Yes. It is what you get, what you don't deserve. And so if that is the case, we would really have more exuberant lives. There's no way I could come late when he has given me that so much that I don't deserve. What we have compromised to and what we've replaced mercy with, and again, we all need it, grace with is mercy. We, we really live mercy lives because mercy says you don't get what you do deserve. So, oh, let me help you. For all the self-righteous, for the wages of sin is still death. In other words, and I'm not talking about, you know, you do wrong, God's going to strike you down. I'm saying that, you know, he's holy. And so he does not, he does not owe us fellowship. Right. He does not owe us to show up on Sunday. But because of his mercy, he does. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say thank you. Hallelujah. And so because he chooses in this season to not judge, we think he's changed his mind. Because he is not judging in a particular season, and because he's not chastising in a particular season, we think that we are living in grace and he's giving me gifts, when actually he's withholding judgment. Yes. Wow. Yes. Oh, y'all, oh, y'all don't want to have church today, but I'm preaching for revival. I'm not preaching to make folk happy anymore. Because the body of Christ is at a crossroads, and the world is at a crossroads, and we need truth. And it's time for us to stop playing church and be church. Prayerfully, one truth and insight into the kingdom that I want to release today, and I'm almost through, um, will move the bite of Christ and the bite of HPFC from anxiety to advancement. I'm just convinced as I look 
and have looked, and I thank God this morning, the last several weeks, couple of weeks, I've seen and am seeing a glimpse into movement and advancement. And we're coming out of lethargy, we're coming out of anxiety, and prayer for this word will shift us to where God had designed for us to be. But my question to you this morning, is there anybody ready for spiritual monopoly? Y'all are quiet. I know, I know y'all deep. Y'all don't play Monopoly. But in Monopoly, when you pass go, you collect $200. In other words, when you advance, you, you, you get compensated. Y'all are quiet. In other words, you've got to move to get compensated. You've, y'all, oh God, I wish I had some help. See, you, you've been waiting to get paid and then get promoted. But you've got to move to get paid. Y'all are quiet. I wish I had some help here. I really feel like preaching now. And so watch this. You've been waiting on God to pull you up, but he's been waiting on you to move. See, you, you, you've been waiting on God to do something for you, and God's been waiting on you to do something for you. Because, Lord, help me now. You, you, you've been waiting on deliverance, and he, he's waiting for you to walk in deliverance. You're waiting for somebody to come open a door. He's waiting for you to walk through the door. You've been waiting on somebody to throw you a lifesaver. He's been waiting for you to just put it around your waist and just get up out the water. He's, or just, oh, maybe he's asking you, waiting for you to walk on the water instead of waiting for another man to help you in this season. I, I wish I had somebody who's ready to advance. And you've, you've been stuck in anxiety. You've been stuck in where you are. You've been stuck in what was and what they did and what they didn't do and what they said and what they didn't say. You've been stuck in anxiety, but he's ready to advance you. Are you ready to move? I dare you touch three people and say, I'm ready to move. Are you? I'm saying, I know. I know. I really, you know, if I, t- I wish you'd tell somebody, you know, it, I, it, it's a shame how long I've been here. Y'all quiet. I mean, I've been on boardwalk and park place for too long. And, I, you know, it, I realize I got to go around the board one time before I can buy. But, you know, I can't buy because I haven't moved. I mean, I, I, I'm, one, I'm one roll away from moving to my next place. And, and I, I don't know why I'm waiting to roll. I, but I've been here stuck on anxiety. I've been fearful of what was and fear of, afraid to fail and afraid to fall. Now, it, it, it. Anybody really ready? I mean, if, if you would just take a real assessment of your life. Can you be honest and say you really moved at all? Yeah. And then let me ask, okay, you, you said you moved, but have you moved according to God's plan? Is Because we all can say, yeah, you know, Pastor, you tripping. I done moved. But, but look at your movement in the context of God's movement. Let me move on. Nine people sleepy already. I often believe we fall short because of the lack of understanding of the kingdom. All right. And because we do not understand the motives, the nature, and character of the kingdom, we live in anxiety. Oftentimes, we, we miss the big picture. And we have a limited revelation understanding of simple truth that keep us as shallow fishers rather than catapult us to deep waters as deep calls unto deep. When you really want fish you, you got to go to the deep yep. I mean if you want perch with a whole lot of bones you just you stay in the shallow end I mean well you really want fish you need fish to catch fish <laughs> Lord help me today Today I want us to look at the kingdom from Matthew's perspective and prayerfully receive revelation we need to advance us further and deeper into this season. Um, What I suggest is we need to go to another dimension in this season. I suggest we misinterpret the kingdom's context, therefore we live passive lives rather than proactive lives. I believe because we've been mistaught the kingdom and have misunderstood the kingdom is that for most of our Christian existence, we've been allowing things to happen to us instead of making things happen for us. All right. All right. Okay, absolutely. As I was talking this morning about spiritual warfare, I suggested that most of us define spiritual warfare as what the devil does to us. 
and we define spiritual warfare as the devil is attacking my family or the devil is attacking my marriage or the devil is attacking my children or the devil is attacking my money. However, when I look closely at the Bible contextually, when the children of Israel fought, most of their fighting occurred is when they were going to the land of promise. And it was not the enemy attacking them. It was them attacking their enemy. Yeah, y'all yeah, couldn't even, half of y'all couldn't even receive that. You just had a blank stare like a calf looking at a new gate. Yeah, we still have this woe is me mentality about what the enemy is doing to me. And it's the enemy attacking me. However, if you are in pursuit of the kingdom and we understand how the kingdom breaks forth, you should realize that if the enemy is attacking you, watch this, he's on a leash. Because one of the most significant I mean, we, there are instances where we see the enemy. When we look at Daniel, there's prayers that were hindered. So I get that. So there's a level and dimension of spiritual warfare we must engage in. That's another, another topic. But when, when I look at a specific example where there was a direct assault on one of God's chosen, let's look at Job. He's walking the enemy saying, man, I wish I could mess with some of God's folk. He says, God, you know what? The only reason they serve you is because you you good. <laughs> the only reason they serve you and come to church on Sunday because they got a little change in their pocket. Uh, you know, life is halfway all right. But you know, it's, it's, it's experience. When they start going through, you know they don't come serve you. <laughs> you know they stay home. He says, I'll tell you what, have you considered my homeboy? Have you considered my, my servant, Job? God, you tripping. Because the only reason he served you because he rich. He got a fine wife. and got a lot of kids. Yes. <laughs> but I guarantee you take, you, take, you take his fine wife away. Take his money away. And take away his kids who taking care of the stuff he has. He'll curse you and die. Oh, is that what you think? Go ahead. I tell you what, you can mess with everything. You can't take his life because I'm the giver of life. And it wasn't as if he was giving permission to the devil in that way. He actually literally reminded the devil, don't forget, you can't touch his life because you don't have that power. I'm going to remind you of the only thing you can touch is his stuff. And although, although his wife and his children are connected to him, that's not his life. And just like I did it once, I could do it again. So go ahead and do what you think you need to do. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this in the context of spiritual warfare then. Uh, the enemy is on a leash. So when you talk about what the enemy is doing, when we understand the kingdom, I, don't ha I should not have anxiety because, Lord, if, if, if the enemy does take it away, God is the God of redemption and he can restore. It's what are you attached to. Can we look at the kingdom? Yes. I'm almost through. I said that before. I'm real almost through. <laughs> so, uh, at least if you don't accept this point, at least agree that this is a salient point. That because of our misunderstanding of the kingdom, that we live most of our Christian lives passively rather than proactively. In other words, our lives are spent on the defense mm -hmm. rather than the offense. Mm -hmm. We spend most of our lives trying to explain what we're going through. Right. We spend most of our lives trying to figure out what am I going through. Mm -hmm. That's passive because when we have to explain what we're going through, we, we, we are allowing life to happen to us instead of making life happen for us. When we're always confused and anxious about why me and why this and I don't understand this and I don't understand it. Why? Why do we have that resolve when the kingdom is forcefully advancing? But we're stuck in anxiety. Wow. 
today we switch. It's been said that a, a good offense is a good defense. I beg to differ. Give me the ball. Let me shoot. I don't want to play a 2-3 zone or a man-to-man instead of I will, but let me give me the pill. Give me the rock. Too many people waiting on the shot to be to be missed, to get the rebound, to get the ball. And we've been spending our lives doing and responding to missed shots by the devil. We spend our whole lives wanting the devil to miss us and dodge and we dodging. Well, I don't mess with my money because, you know, I, you know, I may not. I ain't going to. I don't know if I'm going to be a good steward if you mess with my money. Miss me with that. <laughs> don't mess with my marriage because, you know, if you mess with my marriage, you know, then I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> but don't mess with my friends. Miss me with that. So we spend our whole Christian lives just praying that when the shot goes up, <laughs> please, Steph, don't hit the three, Steph. So we spend our lives as Christians just, just flinching, anxious. Is, is he gonna is he gonna hit the shot? Is he gonna mess with this? He's gonna mess with that. Lord, don't mess, don't, don't let him mess with this. Don't mess with that. So we spend our whole lives walking in fear, thinking that the devil's gonna make a shot. That is not how God, oh God, the kingdom is not passive, just walking around wanting to be missed and trying to dodge this and trying to dodge trouble and trying to dodge death. And you know, I don't want to die, and I don't want, you know, I'm afraid to fail. If I step out in faith, I must, I must, you know, I can't walk on the water. And Lord, I don't want to trust you with two fish and five loaves. I may not have enough to eat. And Lord, I can't give extra because if I give extra, then I don't know if you're gonna take care of me. Lord, I can't tithe because I have bills to pay. Lord, I can't tithe because I'm a single mother, and you know my heart. No, the kingdom forcefully advances I feel my help let's look at this text Matthew 11 and 12 you got 10 minutes I'm out of t- almost out of time let's run from the days of John the Baptist till now the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it this is Dr. One of Dr. Brad Young. Actually, this translation here comes from Brad Young. He taught me New Testament. A foremost theologian of Greek scholar. Um, King James translates this how? The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And so I suggest the King James translation has caused the church to misinterpret and misunderstand the kingdom. Because King James was suggesting, again, um, as scholars and academics, we understand it's not necessarily an error in translation. It's just because of time, we now have better tools of translation. And so when we look at the text and we look at the word forcefully advancing, the Greek word biazo and parats in the Hebrew, we understand that this translation here, which we have, um, NIV, is a better translation than King James. But most of y'all were raised on King James, so your theology is steeped in King James. So you spent your early part of your Christian existence saying that the kingdom suffers violence, that the kingdom is being beat up. That the kingdom is under attack. The kingdom is never under attack. It is it's the kingdom that's moving forward. So when, when the children of Israel were going to possess the land, watch this, they were going to possess the land, they were going to a place they had already been. Right. 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 It baffles me then, so why, why then do I have to fight? It means then that the fight is fixed if I'm going to a place I've already been. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. So watch this. Let let me jump into this teaching and and bring these points. Micah 2.13 gives us a good understanding of this text. Because Micah shows us, let's look at Micah 2.13. Ooh, they own it. Thank you. (laughs) One who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out, their king will pass through them, or pass through before them, the Lord at their head. This is important because Malachi also gives us this formula when it talks about Elijah shall precede the Messiah. So there's always a preparation for what God is going to do. All right. 
So before the Messiah comes, he sends the prophet Elijah to prepare the way. We see in this text in Micah, again, the context of Micah is what? The context of Micah is, is that God says, I'm going to punish you for your idolatry. But hold up, in the middle of that, in chapter 2, he says, before I ex exhibit and extend my punishment on you, I'm going to deliver you from your enemy. Yes. Huh? Yes. I love you so much. You've been, you know, you've been disobedient. You've been idolatrous, but I love you, and I've got to do something for you. So what I will do, I'm going to send what? I'm going to send a breaker to break the wall before you, and then I will lead you. Lord, this is powerful. So watch this. So what, what, what is the requirement? Well, he says, so number one, we need a breaker and we need a king. Uh -huh. We need a breaker and we need a king. The breaker goes forth and prepares a way that I need a king to lead me out. Uh -huh. Lord, have mercy. The picture of the king is the shepherd. Uh -huh. Ooh. Ooh, Lord, 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 Lord. He then goes on to say in, in chapter 5, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So he affirms the prophecy with, the, uh, with Christ. So watch this. The context then of Micah 2 is the, is the, uh, the context of Micah 2 is a shepherd. When we understand that, it gives us a better understanding of Matthew text. All right. So the Matthew text, who was written again for the Jews, is steeped in the Hebrew mindset. So in order to understand Matthew, you've got to understand Micah and Malachi. So if Mike and Malachi has someone preparing a way, then Matthew has to have someone preparing a way. Make sense? Yes, yes. Let's go on with this teaching. I'm, I'm going to dig a little deeper. So the, the focal point in Micah is the breaker and the king. The picture here is, again, is a shepherd. Hit the lights real quick. Thank you, Brother Carl. Man, y'all give them a hand. Man, they only like doggone it. <laughs> So every in the Old Testament, when Matthew talking to his Judy, Jewish audience mentions Micah and talks about the breaker going before them, they automatically pictured the good shepherd. And here's why the shepherd is good. This is what is called a sheepfold. Can y'all see it? A, a round place with a gate and a sheep. Now, these could be elaborate, or they could be in-rigged. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mature. Y'all quiet? I'll say it again. These could be elaborate like this, where there was a lot of stones built nice and neat, or they could be makeshift and in-rigged. You had to find a place to get the sheep in where there would only be one entrance. Why? Because sheep have the propensity to wander. Yes. Yes. And so what the shepherd would do, he would lead them to a place of enclosement. He would get them to a place of a single place where they would be confined, they would be limited, they would be constrained, and there would only be one way in and one way out. That's called the sheep gate. So now if they want to go out, we know the nature of sheep, they are very scary. So the nature of sheep is, so what, what the good shepherd would do, Jesus says, behold, I am the good shepherd. Right. So watch this. We see this is what would be an elaborate sheepfold. It has a built-in wooden gate. I told you they could be makeshift. Show me the other picture, Brother Carl. Like this. So if you notice here, there is no gate. So there is potential for sheep to wander out. Also, wolves can get in. So when Jesus says, I am the gate, he goes as the good shepherd. Here's the entrance, and he lays himself down. the nature of sheep because man is here sheep will not cross over man they can't go in or out because he's the gate and if sheep wants to come in the gate the gatekeeper 
is alert and ready because you've got to cross over me to get to them. But that's not the teaching point. That's only part of the teaching point. The teaching point is this, is that something happens to sheep when they're in there. When sheep are constrained, when sheep are confined all night long, they get anxious. Y'all are quiet. When sheep are together in a place where there's only one entrance, they can't get out, they can't get in. They start wondering and talking among themselves, Lord, I see sheep. I don't see food. Lord, I see sheep. I don't see water. Lord, I see sheep. I don't see fun. It's this anxiety that is built up that if you're not careful, you'll stay in. But the good shepherd says, I'm the gate. And I break forth. In other words, I come create a way for you to come out. Here's a deeper teaching. The kingdom breaks forth and forceful men lay hold of it. In other words, when the gatekeeper prepares the way and opens the gate, He then leads me out. But watch this. I come out with enthusiasm. (laughs) In other words, when he leads me out, I come out with a different mindset. Lord, help me. Help help me. Help me display this. When I come out of the sheepfold where I've been confined all night long, now the only reason I leave It's because I have total trust in the shepherd. Mm -hmm. Lord, help me now. So he says, watch this. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. So while they are constrained, watch this. He names them. While they are constrained, he gets to know them. Lord, while they are constrained and confined, they get to know him. While they're isolated from providing for themselves. I know their stomach is, you know, it's a little challenge, but it's in the challenge of hunger pains. I get to know his voice. Y'all are quiet. It's a a little challenge. It's when when my my throat gets a little dry. I get to understand how the shepherd talks and how the shepherd acts. And I realize that I'm here, but I'm protected. I realized, Lord, I could be in a much worse place than with the shepherd because if I was out there, I would be subject to what's out there. Now I begin to change my perspective when I come out because when I come out this time, I realize where I've been. I've been in his presence and in his presence is the real fullness of joy and at his right hand are the real pleasures forevermore. Because when I'm in the sheepfold, I don't have to worry about the wolf. So when I come out, I come out, I break forth. The sheep never get ahead of the shepherd when they've been in the sheepfold. The only sheep that get ahead of the shepherd are the ones who are wandering. And if you're wondering, you're wondering. You're wondering, is the, sh- is the wolf going to get me? Because if you're wondering, you're by yourself. Because sheep don't wander in twos and threes. Sheep wander by themselves. Y'all are quiet. I wonder why when people go through, they get by themselves and don't want the church to be a part of them. It's because sheep wander by themselves. That's why the Bible says he'll leave the 99. I wish I had some Bible readers now. He'll leave the 99 and go after the 2. He'll leave the 99 and go after the 10. He'll leave the 99 and go after the 12. He'll leave the 99 and go after the 25. No, he'll 
leave the 99 and go after the one. Because if you're wandering, you're wandering by yourself. And God never intended for you to be by yourself. Let me hurry. Nine of y'all are bored this morning. The irony, what I call this text is, is that we need to break forth instead of breaking free. (laughs) See, most Christians are breaking free, but not breaking forth. It's 12.03, I'm out of time. Uh, Now you're five minutes? Let me hurry. And so many of us would much rather break free instead of breaking forth. Well, well, but, but, but you need to break forth, not break free. Yeah. There is irony in the one. Somebody say irony in the one. Irony. In other words, when you are by yourself, when you're alone, you have broken free. You have not broken forth. Whoa. In other words, when you break free, you're actually breaking free to bondage. That's the irony. So when, when, you, when you decide to go by yourself and go it alone, you're actually, watch this, afraid of the adversary, anxious about your appetite, and you have angst of being alone. Who God? You, you have, uh, you're afraid of your adversary. In other words, you are free. You have a fear of the enemy, which is steeped in the fear of failure. All right. You're not really afraid of the wolf. You're afraid of what you can't do because of the wolf. So many people in the church have not understood the kingdom. And so they're afraid of what the enemy will not allow them to do. Because you're being attacked by the devil. And so if you've been attacked and you can't go to school, you can't finish your degree, you, can't nev- you can never be rich. You can never you just have all the excuses what, what the enemy won't let you do because you have a fear of failure. You have your angst about your appetite. It's about to get real um, pastoral, prophetic, preachy, or uh, you don't want to leave after this. Watch this. When you are anxious about your appetite after being afraid of your enemy, when you're doing it by yourself, you will have a desire to be celebrated rather than being rewarded. See, the problem with the one, we want to be celebrated and still are rewarded. God does not celebrate us. He rewards us. The world will celebrate you. They will applaud you in your mess. They'll applaud you as long as you're doing what they want you to do. But God says, I reward the faithful. So we don't want to be faithful. We just want to be famous. I say, we don't want to be faithful. We just want to be famous. We want to be celebrated. Next, we desire a crowd above the crown. I'll say it again. We desire the crowd above the crown. Crown speaks of integrity. Crowd speaks of entertainment. And we desire fame instead of honor. We would rather be famous than honored. Because famous speaks of what we do. Honor speaks of who we are. Let me hurry. The third part of breaking forth. Lord, help me now. There's a redemption sequence where we have shepherd king, shepherd king, shepherd king. You must have a shepherd first. When you, when you are shepherded, you have, it's the credential for knowing. You need Christ's shepherding because he knows your soul. <laughs> Lord, help. He, you need to be shepherded. You need a shepherd in your life because he knows your emotional state. Right. You need a king for your inheritance. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, only a king can give you your inheritance. And your king, watch this, helps you to regulate the authority in your life. Wow. So you do not abuse your power. Yeah. See, you can, you, you can abuse your power either by doing or by not doing. Right. See, you abuse power if you don't walk in who you are, not just... See, it's an abuse of power for God to empower you and you not use that power. That's, that's an abuse. <laughs> the break free cycle is what I call the conviction cycle where you serve self and prince instead of the shepherd and king. Right. So when you break free in your oneness and in your, in your isolation, Self is characterized by the choice of appetites, season of isolation, and carnal consequences. The prince is you on the throne. 
where you have temporal pleasure, glass ceiling social promotion, and influence rather than dominance. Lord help. I really don't have time for that. So what are you saying, Pastor? Let me hurry to a close. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven breaks forth, and those breaking forth are pursuing or seeking it. And watch this, and everyone breaks forth with it. All right. So when the kingdom breaks forth, you break forth. Amen. All right. It's time for the body of Christ to break forth. To break out of anxiety, to break out of this place of confinement. He is no longer confining you. He is leading. So watch this. Here's, here's one thing we, we, re we realize about the shepherd. Sheep follow him. He's saying, come on. He doesn't, he doesn't lead us from behind. He walks in front of us and says, come on. What, what are you waiting for? One of the most frustrating things I do in the eighth grade, Lord help me. I have to walk my kids to lunch. My lunch is your lunch. You get 30 minutes. I get 30 minutes. But when you walk slow, you're on my time. I need you to follow the shepherd to the lunchroom. In Jesus' name, because I want all of my minutes. I don't want 29 and a half. 29 and a half minutes won't do when I've got to eat my salad and my apples. I need you to come on expeditiously. <laughs> and some of us are like the 8th grade at room 108. He's leading and walking and you're talking to people and not moving in the direction that you're supposed to be moving. He's walking, getting you to the lunchroom, getting you to the place of provision, getting you to the place of promise, and you're dragging your feet. You're still hanging around in class. Class has been dismissed. You've learned what you needed to learn. You've received what you needed to receive. It's time for you to break forth. It's time for you to go forward. It's time for you to walk in power. It's time for you to walk in dominion. You've got to trust the shepherd. Yeah, oh, oh, now Psalm 23 rings in my ears. The Lord is my shepherd. I think I'll follow him. The Lord is my shepherd. I know I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh God, I feel the anointing of God. Where are you? Come from out of the sheepfold and follow your shepherd. Sheep are anxious to break free due to night confinement. But your confinement is purposeful. When he confines you for a season, it will protect you from your enemy. It will provide for your palate. He will give you exactly what you need when he isolates you. And as proof of personhood, he will show you who he is when nobody else is around. Two, the shepherd is the only one willing to lay down his life and be the door for the sheep. Yeah. 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 Your pastor is your pastor. He's not the shepherd. Yeah. All I can do is be pastor. I can't be shepherd. I can't lay down my life. I don't have the power. Yeah. Sheep are led. Ergo, they walk behind the shepherd because they trust him. Sheep follow out of confinement. When you've been confined and constrained, when it's time to walk with the shepherd, when he walks, you run with passion. You break forth. Sheep break through temporary constructs via expectation of provision on the other side of the established limitations. In other words, when it's time for the, when the shepherd walks, I break forth of everything that's temporal. Watch this. Another translation is, not only do sheep break forth, but they widen where the shepherd was. <laughs> Why am I supposed to widen where the shepherd made an opening so other sheep can get out more freely? Uh, yeah. So now the shepherd broke through, two sheep could get in, but I'm supposed to bring somebody with me with excitement and expectation, and they come, and what the, y'all stand up, and so there's a place they're supposed to break through, and they open a way, come here, stand up, baby, stand up, come on, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, walk this way, y'all walk this way, y'all walk this way, yep, and y'all come through here, 
y'all come through here and watch this. Y'all just keep coming. And the way is supposed to get wider and wider. It's supposed to get, every time somebody comes, the way is supposed to expand. Why? Because sheep break forth. Y'all miss it. I said, y'all can go back to your seat. Thank y'all for being here. I said, sheep break forth. Once the kingdom breaks free in you, then you break forth. Here's the teaching. It's not new. Watch this. And I'm closing. Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power or dunamis when the Holy Ghost. Dunamis comes from the Greek word dynamo. And it's, it's the inherent power. The best picture I have of a dunamo, Lord, takes me back to when I was uh, seven. 1977. You may not know. Some of y'all will be able to get with your boy. But a nice uh, toy came out. <laughs> and this toy was modeled after a certain daredevil. And this daredevil was known for riding a motorcycle. It was red, white, and blue. And this motorcycle rider had stars on his. He also had a nice star and helmet. He wasn't a savior, but he also wore a cape. He wasn't Superman. His name was Evil Knievel. I never understood why they called him evil. I thought he was a wonderful guy. But they called him Evil Knievel. Evil Knievel was known for... Yeah. And they made a toy. You could have Evil Knievel yourself. But Evil Knievel came with special instructions. He didn't take batteries, Brother Andre. He had to have brute strength. He had to wind old evil up. He had to crank old evil up. And if you crunk him enough, you hit a button, he'd take off. That's the dynamo that the Holy Spirit is. It's what's working on the inside of you. And watch this. When, it, when, when, when the Holy Ghost begins to work on the inside of you, something happens to all of you. Y'all miss it. I said, when he works on the inside of you, something happens to all of you. And the reason there may not be breakthrough in your life is because there's no breakthrough inside of you. Because when he works in you, you automatically break forth. That's why scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In other words, the translation is that the water is flowing because it bubbles up out of you. God is doing something in you. Are you standing as well? Come on, men, let's get ready to sing this song. The question is, are you going to stay in anxiety or will you move to advancement? Listen, I told you, church, I was, man, I was, I was, I was kind of struggling. As God was pruning me of some things, and he's still pruning this house and getting us ready for more. But how many people know that's not easy? And so I'm saying, Lord, this became my prayer. The safest place for Patrick to be is in your will. Check one. And Lord, it doesn't always feel easy. Yes. It doesn't always feel good. But I'm going to stay. Hallelujah. Because the picture I had was a shepherd <laughs> laying at this gate. Laying there for me. And saying, Patrick. Well. If you stay in, I'll protect you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you stay in, I'll provide for you. Yes, sir. If you stand, I'll get to know you. <laughs> and can I say, church, the last, I don't know, two months, I'm getting to know him differently again. Well. And maybe that's what he wants to do for you. All right, all right. Maybe he's confining you to protect you. Maybe he's giving you exactly what you need when you don't see what you think you're supposed to see. And maybe he's confining you because he wants to get to know you just a little differently. They want to get want you to get to know him. Will you stay in that place? But when it's time to break forth, it's time to break forth. And I believe our season is coming. Where he says, I'm, I'm getting ready to move. I'm getting ready to walk. Will you trust me to prosperity? Will you trust me with promise? Yeah, yeah.
Hey, this is Pastor Patrick McGrew. Thank you so much for watching the Higher Praise Family Church YouTube channel. If you have not already, make sure you subscribe to our channel. If the messages have been a blessing to you, hey, please share with your family, your friends, coworkers, your neighbors, and allow them also to get connected to what's going on at Higher Praise Family Church. Also, you can download our app, Higher Praise app, to see what's going on and stay connected. Again, thank you again for watching. God bless. Hope to see you soon.